There is a fundamental difference between fossil fuel or combustion technology and electric technology, electrotech, and it's inefficiency. So the internal combustion engine that drives our cars, for example, is like 20, 25, 30% efficient. The rest of that energy, 80, 70 to 80%, is lost through your exhaust pipe or out the heat out of your engine block, that sort of thing. On the other hand, the electric motors that drive electric cars are like 90, 95% efficient. So they don't require as much energy to do the same amount of work. And that's the same principle holds true across the, uh, across the uh, spectrum of energy technologies. And so the, we're stuck with a, a paradox of if you electrify, you need a lot more electricity, you actually need less energy. And that's something that the oil and gas and the, you know, the fossil fuel advocates haven't quite grasped yet. Now, would you agree, Dan, that this is an idea that's it kind of, I know that your, you and your team at uh, Ember Energy have written extensively about it, but it's really not well understood in the West, is it? It's not well understood um, and underappreciated. We tend to look at energy through the lens of primary energy demand that goes into the system. And, and that's where we what we report on uh, when you see energy reports. Uh, but really what's of course much more important is not so much what energy goes in, but what kind of useful energy are we actually getting out? And by useful energy, I just mean like the, the, the energy that warms up the water so we can have a hot shower or the fridge that runs so we can have a cold beer. That is really why we care about energy. We don't care about the barrels of oil that go in. They are in service of something larger. And it's, it's once you start looking at the energy system through this dual lens, so not just of what goes in, but what goes in and what comes out, you start seeing that the current fossil energy system is just incredibly inefficient. We lose two thirds of the energy that we put into the system mostly because of thermal losses, as you put it in combustion engines, in cars, in power plants to make electricity, all of this, we lose two thirds, some 380 exajoules per year, we lose to the inherent inefficiency of the thermodynamics of fossil fuels. And that is if we just translate it to dollars, just, just it's 5% of global GDP, almost $5 trillion per year that people spend on fuels that subsequently go up into smoke. I mean, literally go up into smoke because you burn the stuff and it, and, it, and it disappears. And so this is the first realization before we even can start talking about the benefits of electrotech is many people don't realize that a supposedly well efficiently run economic system, the energy industry, is actually incredibly inefficient. And it's when you start realizing that, that you then subsequently can realize that if electrotech is indeed three times more efficient than fossil tech, and it holds on the supply side, on generation of electricity, but also on the demand side with electric vehicles and heat pumps, there's just a 3x improvement in efficiency. Then you start to realize what promise uh, electricity has and electrotech has for the energy system. You can probably cut energy demand significantly, even if, even as we raise energy services and uh, the energy industry for the whole world. Let me illustrate what I meant uh, earlier by saying that it's not well understood. Um, the you know we, in a previous interview we talked about the framing of the uh, you know what we call here the uh, oil and gas forever narrative, and advocates of those uh, point of view point to the primary energy demand graph from 1945 to now. Uh, the amount of energy used, uh, produced, and then used is the graph is exponential. It, it, uh, it's an amazing amount of energy. But their argument is that each as each new form of energy came along, it was only added to the growing demand. And it, there was so there was diversification, not displacement is their mantra. And so they say, with given the rise of the global south, with you know uh, emerging economies and a middle class and their demand for for cars and you know kind of the lifestyle that the West has enjoyed for a long time, that the exact same process will take place. That primary energy demand will grow you know by 40, 50 percent, 100 percent, whatever, and the electricity produced by wind and solar. Uh, will only be added to the mix. It will not displace any of the of the oil and gas. 
And this argument about efficiency undercuts that argument, does it not? It does. It does. Also, I, I find the argument hard to square with the data that we see. Because yes, indeed, at a global level, we see a more and more and more argument work out. It's only become more. But let's not forget that if we look at uh, electricity generation, about half the world is already past its peak of fossil fuels. And fossil fuels are in, de in definite decline in these countries, fossil fuel demand. Uh, the same is the case for more than 75% of countries on final energy demand. So the actual energy that people are purchasing, we see that 75% of the world is actually past its fossil peak. So it's an argument that holds at the global level, but actually once you dive into it, you say like, okay, surely then this must mean that at a country level, we also see this, this, this play out. That's not the case. Coal demand has gone down in Europe. It has gone down in the US. It has gone down in many parts of the world. It's just been offset by other countries rising, but it, there's no inherent technical reason why these other countries cannot reduce their coal demand as well, especially now that we have this new generation of technology coming in that is just doing the same, much more leaner, much more cheaper and much more secure than uh, what uh, fossil fuels are doing for them. Canada um, stopped burning coal uh, quite a while ago. I mean, we're, you know, we are... Uh, electricity system is almost coal free. So we tend to focus on on oil and gas. And one of the the uh, processes that's not well understood is the slowing of demand growth in the 2020s, particularly at, in the last few years. And the between now and, and 2030, it's not going to rise much at all. Uh, and a lot of that is because China's uh, oil demand is peaked. And it looks like it's going to start uh, declining a little bit between, over the next five years. And that, that this is, again, something that you and I talked about in a previous interview, uh, which is that the new energy sources, the new energy technologies, first they take demand. They satisfy rising demand. And once that's done, once they've taken 100% of that, then they begin eating into the existing uh, uh, base of demand, the ex existing demand. And that seems to be ready to take place like 2030, 2029. I think the, uh, the International Energy Agency actually is, has got this right. At the global level, indeed. But the interesting thing is, of course, Markham, we've been seeing this taking place all over the world already. It's just not happened on the global average. But we have many examples of countries where exactly this has already happened, sometimes as early as like a decade earlier or even more that this has happened. So we know that this dynamic, this is not a theoretical dynamic of first you take the growth and then you push into existing demand. This is actually a dynamic that we've seen play out from one country to the next. And the only thing that we need to believe in is that the frontier countries are a leading indicator of what is happening at the global scale. And if we take that lens, then it becomes very clear that you will get a reduction of fossil fuel demand. And on top of that, of course, comes this just the, the simple fact that because Electrotech is so much more efficient, you don't get a one for one replacement. But the whole energy market, like the total exajoules that we put into the system, will also just decline over time, even as we raise services and energy access across the world. So we're just talking about a market that is bloated right now. There's a, a fossil inefficiency bubble uh, that is popping because of Electrotech. Uh, and we will see the total market for energy becoming smaller, even as we are going to get much more useful energy out of the energy system. And I, I've got an example of, of the oil and gas industry not understanding that, that basic principle, because it wasn't that long ago that uh, Alberta Premier Danielle Smith uh, got together with Ontario Premier uh, Doug Ford, and, and Ontario is our biggest province, about 15 to 17 million people, and said, we want to build a pipeline uh, from Alberta into southwestern Ontario to supply oil for your refineries. Well, the problem with that is that over the last uh, five, 10 years, uh, the demand for gasoline has fallen. It used to be 16 million barrels a day, now it's 15 million, sorry, uh, uh, I forget the uh, uh, the metric for, for measuring it, but it fell, I think it fell by, a, oh, uh, liters. It fell by a million liters uh, a year 
uh, over the space of about five years, and it's continuing to decline. And a lot of that is due to uh, better fuel economy in, in vehicles. So as we see more electric vehicles, then we'll see that decline further. And yet the oil and gas industry still wants to build the infrastructure required to get its product into market because that's the way they've always done it. And they don't understand yet this the principles you're talking about around efficiency and useful energy versus uh, you know primary demand. Yes, I mean we talk in our in our report a bit about these two views, and I agree that sort of the incumbent fossil view has has doesn't fully appreciate this efficiency benefit and 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 how much that means for giving tailwinds to this new generation of electrotech. I would say the second view that we highlight, the climate view, the sort of the technocratic view of we must get emissions down, I, I would say has a similar blind spot. You see it in many of the solutions that come actually from the sort of more technocratic climate space to the fore. Uh, they also don't appreciate that less efficient technology is just very hard to phase in. When we talk about carbon capture and storage, it's just the energy that that takes to build that on top of an existing coal plant, or even worse, like a direct air capture, the amount of energy you need to put into a machine to basically filter out carbon out of, the, out of thin air and put that underground. Those are incredibly inefficient solutions. And so this is where a lot of broader clean tech that, that is proposed actually has none of these tailwinds that Electrotech have, right? So uh, an electric vehicle actually has the tailwind of being much more efficient. A fuel cell vehicle, still more efficient than, than a gas vehicle, but not incredibly efficient, especially not one made with blue hydrogen, then it's definitely less efficient. It gets even worse when we start talking about e-fuels or biofuels, or when we start talking about e-methane in gas boilers versus a heat pump. A lot of these other pieces of clean tech actually don't have the, the same benefits as Electrotech has. And this is what we keep arguing as well, this is what differentiates Electrotech within the larger bucket of clean tech, why it's kind of special is because these are the technologies that benefit from being more efficient. Wider clean tech, not necessarily so. So I think this underappreciation for the basic physics actually is on both sides. It's both on the fossil side and on the very extreme climate technocratic side. Uh, and both sides underappreciate how big of a driver just the simple physics of efficiency are to successful technology. It's also a driver of adoption in the global south. And, you know, the, I think everybody knows the story about how Africa, uh, when uh, cell phone technology came along, instead of just replicating what the West had done and going to landlines, they leapfrogged over the old technology and adopted the, the new. So everybody now has got a cell phone. Nobody's got a, a landline at home. And there was a lot of skepticism in the oil and gas industry that this would happen in the global south. And OPEC, for example, its, uh, its oil demand modeling specifically rejects that, that, ar that argument. But I think we're already seeing that Africa and uh, a lot of Asian nations and, and some in Latin America are already on their way to leapfrogging uh, the old, uh, you know, oil and gas and, and uh, gasoline and diesel kind of model and moving to Electrotech. 63% of emerging markets, uh, countries in emerging markets, um, have leapfrogged the United States in terms of solar uptake. Uh, a quarter of emerging markets have overtaken the United States in terms of electrification, like the share of energy they get from electricity. These are stunning numbers and numbers that only make sense when you look at this as a technology revolution where emerging markets are just picking the cheaper, leaner and more secure energy technologies. And so that's, uh, that it's one of the interesting data points that we're seeing coming out now over the past two years time and again that really confirms, we feel, our thesis of having an electrotech view on the world is we, we keep getting data that doesn't match in any of the two conventional views on energy. This is not a toy for the rich as the fossil fuel sector would have. It's not additive and, and just a fringe marginal addition to a heavily fossil fuel system. This is not the case. It is also not a, a case that all of these countries have suddenly made very ambitious climate plans and have become very forward looking in how they want to organize their energy system around carbon. This is something different. And this is what we call this is electrotech. This is revolutionary technology coming in and changing the world. There's a very interesting discussion going on in, um, about the international energies uh, agencies, uh, energy demand uh, modeling. 
And they're, when it, the report comes out next month, it's rumored to have a current policy scenario added to the, and that shows uh, really aggressive uh, demand growth for oil and gas out, out to 2050. And this so reflects the oil and gas uh, industry's view of how the the world is going to uh, uh, going to move forward, and it's the the narrative of it uh, completely ignores all of the electrotech arguments that we've been making in in these uh, these interviews so far. And the problem here is that those countries that don't get it will be slower to adapt, slower to adopt, and will suffer the economic consequences. I too have read this uh, the leak on the the CBS. Uh, I don't know what to call it, the, the 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 crude profit scenario or whatever we want to call it. Uh, it. You know what the interesting thing is? I think Mark, and it's the best way to look at it is it's a normative scenario. We we know that the Trump administration is leaning on the IEA to make sure they also make forecasts that other countries can use to uh, like the US can use to argue for their policies. It's as normative as a net zero scenario. I think we are now in a world where it's it's not very believable that the IEA net zero scenario is going to be followed anymore. This will be, uh, pan out differently. Whether we hit net zero or not, I don't even want to make a comment about, but that's not going to play out like the IEA says. I think it's becoming very clear. The CPS scenario, I think, is equally normative, but on the other side, this is just a historic effort to block a massive technology revolution from taking place. So we have basically two normative scenarios from the IEA, a net zero scenario where we go as fast as we can and we even do crazy things like CCS and other things just to get with, uh, to stay within our carbon budget. And then we have the CPS, which is the opposite, which is a historic effort to block change from happening and make sure that we use as much fossil fuels as we can. Neither is very realistic. Both kind of exemplify the two camps of the energy transition debate that we talk about. And the real scenarios that the IA, of course, focuses on, which is the steps in the APS scenario, those are the scenarios that are much more realistic. And we sit much more towards the APS, like this, this more advanced, this faster scenario. But these are the realistic scenarios that we should be looking at. So we'll see next month as it comes out. But the way I see it is that we just got another normative scenario for one side of the fossil, uh, on the fossil side of the debate. So they have a, a toy scenario to play with. But we all know that the realistic scenarios sit somewhere there in between. Yeah, uh, I've mentioned our uh, energy transition theory of change, which focuses on uh, innovative disruptions, technology disruptions of industries and business models. So we look at those models, the scenarios from the IEA and OPEC and others, and say, okay, given that there's uh, these disruptive technologies that are entering the energy system, what 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 does what does the ev uh, the current evidence how does it line up against these various scenarios and at this point and things are subject to change of course i would say that the evidence supports the aps scenario which is you know a fall in demand from of oil from 105 million barrels a day down to 55 which you know that would be bad news uh, for canada uh, those sorts of things but on that note dan uh, another great conversation thank you very much Thank you, Markham.